This is Julius Craig, Delta Fly Job Force Podcast. Tonight we have Mr. Dan Enfall, the one and only hunt, hunting beast, with us. Uh, how are you doing, Mr. Dan? Pretty good. How are you doing? Oh, I'm real. I'm real good. I appreciate you taking this time and you know taking out of your day and doing this. And you know, this is this, this you know means a lot to us. Appreciate that. Um, so. Uh, most people, you know, I guess if they listen to a bunch of podcasts and they're in the deer world, they know who you are. So, um, but if you want to, you know, you're, you're Dan and Falk, the hunting beast. Uh, let's see, what is it? The book, the big buck serial killer. Uh, so, uh, I mean, to, uh, most of you, you've killed, most of your deer come out of Wisconsin, huh? Um, most of them, I've killed them in a few different states, majority of them are near my house usually okay uh, so that was a question i did have for you if you hunted out of state or stayed real close to home yeah i, I travel and uh go to a lot of spots but uh, you, you know really okay. people think i live in a pristine area that's just full of big bucks and i don't the area in wisconsin that i live at is pretty over, overpopulated i mean we got really good genetics and we've got really big bucks but uh, there's a lot of pressure and a lot of people that shoot everything. So um, it's not the greatest destination, even within Wisconsin. There's you know, a few hours away, it's way better. Um, but, you know, in hindsight, I can hunt by my house just about any day. You know, I get off of work, run out, I can, I can uh, free up an hour and just run out and hunt. And because of that, I usually end up shooting my biggest bucks real close to home, even though some of my destinations that are further away are way better hunting spots. Okay. Um, yeah, that's what, like you said, like, you know, they pretty much shoot everything. That's like being here at the house. I'm from uh, South Louisiana, and um, they, they kind of, a lot of them still want to go with that brown it's down theory. And, um, you know, so big bucks are, you know, hard. They're not, we have a lot. It's just like you said, though, it's just, you know, finding them and being in the right area. You know, right. um, we uh getting into like that. Uh, Ben, what was you? Can you hear us, Ben? Yeah, yeah. I got. A, I actually have a follow up on that, Dan. Uh, so you know, for guys that do travel to hunt, you know, I know you used observation hunts a lot to kind of hone in on that buck to get to the right spot. You know, how else can you find or make that step to hunt a mature buck? if you don't have the option to do an observation set? Well, I mean, uh, a lot of footwork, you know, um, I, I really get a kick out of going to places I've never been to before. I mean, I do way better if I've been there before or if I've pre-scouted it. Like, um, in the past, I've gone out of state, scouted an area you know, for a few days, and then came back for a hunt. And I think it's, you're way better off if you did like, uh, instead of doing a 10 day hunt, you took three days and went scouting in spring and then came back for a seven day hunt. You know, you know what I mean? You'd have way, yeah. a way better hunt, but I kind of like the, um, the challenge of going to some place I've never been, haven't scouted and diving in. And when I do that, um, for me, it's a lot of footwork. There ain't deer everywhere and there ain't big bucks on every public property. So you gotta, um, walk through a lot of terrain. You gotta do a lot of search and you gotta find a sign that shows you that there's a big buck there and then narrow your search. So, you know, for those that watch my videos, they probably see me doing an awful lot of walk and an awful lot of scouting, and even during hunt times. Uh, when I went down to Indiana, I was having a hard time finding bucks this year. And, and what really got me onto the bucks was just saying, I'm wandering around not finding anything. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get in my truck and I'm gonna find them. So I went around right. at prime time in the morning when most guys are in a tree and found where the bucks were in, uh, you know, by driving around looking at crop fields adjacent to the public. And then once I found them diving in, then I got opportunities. You know, you got to think outside the box. So would you say it's kind of the kind of scout, scout, scout hunt mentality a little bit where I guess, you know, I'm hunting – back to where I grew up, it's two hours away or up in New York. I live in Northeast Pennsylvania where, you know, I might be driving an hour or two hours to go hunt these places once a week, twice a month, something like that. So I'm familiar with them, 
they're close, but they're not close enough where I can get that daily observation. I can't go in my backyard and check them out. Mm -hmm. So well, where do you feel? I mean, you gotta you gotta uh, get as much scouting as you can while you're hunting. You know, like a lot of guys will tell me they go on a rut trip. You, you, you know, so they'll go down to like Rundown, Ohio, or they'll run out to Iowa, someplace they haven't been before, and they'll go on a rut hunting week. And they'll tell me to maximize their success. They'll hunt all day. And I'm thinking, when do you scout? Right. Are you just going by with something you phone on a map or something? So for me, a lot of my hunts will start by just hunting a couple hours in the morning or an hour or something, and then getting down and just search and search and search until I find that spot for an evening. You're, you're... And I just I'll just keep repeating that until I get a, until I get onto action. You know, I'll be looking for that hot sign. And uh, I think a lot of guys uh, are, uh, if they don't scout enough, they're just kind of plopping themselves in trees because it's a funnel or something. And I don't think that's how you shoot monster bucks. You know, the really big ones just don't go running through funnels. Stupid. You yeah. know, if they did, everybody'd have them. Yeah, like you said, like spend an hour or two hunting that morning and then scout after that, you're in look and everything. You're not, once you find your sign, you're not worried about, say, if you bump that deer out of there, do you just move on and try and find something else or do you yeah maybe or i try to figure out where he went or you know it depends on the bump i mean if you uh uh soft bump him or hard bump him it's a huge difference like a soft bump if you don't smell you or he just hears you or sees you and just kind of trots away it's a huge difference than he gets up blowing and barreling over trees and uh blowing his way away and running for 100 miles an hour you know, okay. a different kind of bump. Yeah. So, I mean, if you, if you soft bump him, he runs away, he might just run it back. I see that happen quite a bit. Um, and, and mature bucks do not want to run, you know, two miles, regardless of what anybody thinks. They want to go a short distance and hide. So you can look at the way he went and kind of look at the terrain and say, well, I think he's going to end up over here. You know, take a guess at it and, and, and readjust and shift on him. You know, he's not going to probably not going to come back to right where you're standing but you probably uh will hold up over there and then there's only so many different ways he could go and you can make a setup on that okay um that that makes a lot of sense i had never really thought about like how hard the bump was like my thought was i bumped him and he you know i, I messed that up uh you know no matter how hard he left do you think there's an age, you know, uh, uh, older buck will react differently than, you know, middle-aged deer? Is that a factor? Absolutely. Um, every age class seems to be different to me. And uh, this is going to sound bizarre, but I think uh, the older ones, when you get them to be like six, seven years old, are easier to hunt. They're just harder to find. And the reason I say that is because... Um, they hole up in, in uh, certain bedding areas and it's really hard to even kick them out of them. You know, they just want to stay there because they know that that's a safe spot and they've always escaped danger there and been able to go around it and get back. Um, so once you find them, the finding them is the hard part. But once you find them, they did, they're they not that hard to hunt. I mean, you can kind of bump them a few times and they just keep coming back. Whereas I think when you find a big three-year-old or, or a real big two-year-old, um, you bump them and they're the ones that'll run a mile and you won't see them again. Those real big ones kind of hole up in certain little areas and stuff. And not every deer is the same. I mean, you'll get one big buck that has a five mile range and you'll get one that lives in a half mile and never leaves it, you know. But I think it's more of a trait with the older bucks to uh, just kind of slyly move around you and stay in the same spot. All right. And, um, uh... So yeah, uh, quick like you said, like age age frame. Um, my question there, something you you talk about a lot is uh the height of the rub on a tree, determine mm -hmm. like the higher up you, you you talk chest height a lot of times. I'm gonna I'm ask a dumb question I guess or like kind of a how tall are you to like chest height because like I wanna you know like. <laughs> You know, because, like, if I say chest, and I, the way I mean it, like, if I say chest height. Where are you guys located at? I'm in uh, South Louisiana. Yeah, they're probably lower for you guys. Yes, sir, because I was going to say, like. You're strain of deer. I, I mean, so you, you're probably looking at, like, uh, you know, hip high or something well, for the center of the rub well, for a real mature buck. But uh, for me, I, I'm six foot two. 
that's why I was asking because I'm like chest height for you might be like chin height for me because I'm like I'm five six five seven, mm-hmm. so yeah. Mm-hmm. That's why I was asking. Uh, ben, um, y'all still here? I'm still here. Uh, I think it's me and you right now. I don't know what happened to them. Um, uh, but yeah, um, that was like I kind of chuckled because I heard yeah I hear you say that. And I'm like you know what did they uh you know what's what's the height of what. And, um, uh, you know, cause it was just a, uh, something, you know, made me wonder that, um, so, uh, that was one of my main questions. And I guess what, another thing, uh, when you go in and like you said, you're looking for a bed, like, you know, like he, he uses this bed or he might be using, you know, you've got it narrowed down to four or five beds. What makes you pick that bed that particular day? Um, it depends on the terrain really. Um, like, uh, in marshes and swamps, which is probably what you're hunting more of. Yes, sir. They, they pretty much bed uh, um, in the spots based on sound, so they're there most of the time. Um, where if you get into hills and uh, terrain features and stuff, they bed wind-based. So they'll be bed on uh, leeward hills, leeward points, with the wind going over the hill. Um, but in swamps, they're, they're going to they're gonna bed more based on you know, sound of your approach and uh, having a good escape and stuff like that. They, they really love to have a water-based protection. So they like to be near near dry land, but in water where there's trees and stuff and thick cover where they can bed. Um, they like to have, you know, water isolation. Okay. Because predators and people just don't go through the water after them usually. Well, yes, yeah, sir, and that, that actually leads me my, to my next question. Like, they got an area that... I hunt, like, I've seen good deer in it. I've never got in close enough to kill one. But I know it holds good deer, and I've seen good deer. But, you know, going in and sign, it's got a creek on the backside, and then it's got a slough in it, with, and it's a big oak flat, then, you know, with pine plantation, and, um, like, cut over pine by it comes to a point and everything. So probably the bed would probably be more towards the point to go into that, um, out of the big, in the, where that points, like at the big woods and the, the big oaks and like the, uh, the pine, the, uh, little pine, the pine sapling cut over the bed's probably closer to there so he could escape better, you'd think? Yeah. Okay. So, so you might find like, like a bed on a, uh, on a point that goes onto a lake mm-hmm. where the escape would be through the lake. And I would probably bet money it's not a mature buck when you find that. Okay. Just using that. And they're going to have a good escape where it's easy for them to get away. Okay. You know, it, but there'll be deer better than just about every point. There'll be deer better all over the woods. But the big bucks will be better than the spots where they should be. Okay. All right. Uh, I got a question for you here, Dan. I'm, I've been watching you and the, uh, the hunting public for a while now. And I, uh, I, I just want to know, like, your tactics um, in compared from – ground hunting with a bow like whether it be you know i don't hunt out of a blind i just hunt from the ground most of the time compared to hunting from a, a climber or a hang on like what tactics change and what what's something to you know develop better for like the ground hunting scenario so so nothing really changes for me tactic wise um however there's you know challenges for each of them and there's uh benefits of each of them you know um i tend to i I would tend to think that the benefits of being in a tree outweigh the benefits of being on the ground most of the time but i mean you can move as the thermals move on the ground you can shift around um but deer are really in tune with what's going on at eye level in the ground you can hear them coming from a long distance in a tree you can't they catch you by surprise on the ground they get real close before you hear them or notice them because the sound carries oh, up cool. real well but doesn't carry through that brush and through that terrain and, and over hills very well at ground level and they tend to get really close to you where you notice them uh, on the ground and bust you a lot and your wind stays down at ground level to, you, you don't blow up out of there kind of thing it, it swirls around on, under the trees and stuff so ground has always been a challenge for me but I do you know I'm going to hunt the deer wherever it is. And in a lot of cases, right. that is hunting them off the ground. Um, and then I just got to 
you know, make that work. And I've, I've killed a few good bucks off the ground. But uh, um, honestly, I'd much prefer being in a tree. Okay, so uh, you, mainly, you know, you'll hunt what it presents you, but you prefer to be in a tree is what you're saying. Uh, Correct. Okay. Um, is there a magic number that you like to be or like just whatever? Because I've heard you talk about like when you, this is probably about, Four years ago, the podcast came out where you're talking about your buddy had hung a stand at like 18 feet or whatever, and mm -hmm. or 20 feet, and he was he couldn't figure out why the deer were winding him. And one day he reached over his head to turn his um um to check the wind. The, sorry, yeah. I'm drawing a mind blank. Yeah, I think I know what spot you're talking about. He, he was checking the milkweed and when he put the milkweed above his head, then it blew over everything. Yes, yeah, sir. It went a totally actually, different way. He shot one of my big bucks out of that setup. Yeah, and that's what... And that very, very same tree, I just went six feet higher in that original spot. Yeah, and that's that, and it, that made that much, just, it, it made a world of difference, like, apparently. It just, because yep. the, the thermal was carrying the milkweed different, I, you know, I'm trying to figure out how I'm trying to word the question there. Uh, it was carrying it different at that height. What, what the thing was, is where the, where the tree was, is you're down in the trees, and the wind was at my back, the, the deer were on a, a leeward hill, so the wind's blowing over the hill, and where I got to be is upwind of the deer. You know, and, and really you're upwind of them if you're downhill too, because there's a thermal coming up. So I'm sitting right where that extreme drop is, and both winds meet there, the thermal wind and the regular wind. But, so if you drop milkweed, it would go forward, you know, there's a little bit of an opening, and it would hit those trees and just drop right down to where those deer are. But if you got just up a little higher, you were above and in line with the sky, and actually even a little skylight. So you you, you were you, you had to be a little careful about moving because you had to get up higher than the trees, the other <laughs> trees, because this was a bigger tree. Mm -hmm. And then that wind would blow as long as it was a you know a steady wind and not dead calm. If it was dead calm it'd kill you, you know. But with a steady wind, it would blow out over where that deer was coming through and drop past him. So. Uh, that's why I was able to take a deer in that setup. Okay. So, Dan, with that, will, you know, your scouting spots, you're in, you know, this time of year, this is when you make your, make your head. Will you ever hang a stand and, you know, test the wind from up there this time of year, or will it change by the time, you know, winds change in the fall? Well, uh, it might be a little different down by you, but up here it's uh, still basically winter time when we're scouting and it's, there's no leaf cover at all, and uh, it's pretty cold out, so the thermals and, and stuff are, are a lot different. And even the wind, it just blows through the dead sticks pretty easy. So um, really, I've gotten really good at predicting what's going to happen because I've looked at it so many times you know, throughout my lifetime, and I use milkweed uh, when I hunt. So I, I think some of it's going to be trial and error. You, you, you look at it like, okay, um, just think about water rushing past you and you're looking forward with the wind, right? What's it going to do when it hits obstacles and stuff like that? Like if there's a block of trees, um, some, some of the water would go right through the trees, right? But some of it would splash off to the sides. Wind does the right. same thing. So I'm trying to look at where the wind's going to go and I'm trying to set up in a way that, that, that won't, uh, screw me. Right. So, right. um, I think I've got a good vision for that. I see it. I can see it in the setup, you know. Um, and I'm usually pretty accurate. But I don't think I was always like that. I think that's through um, thinking in that manner and then testing it. But uh, uh, you guys got milkweed down there? I don't think I. I don't think we do. I, I haven't. I mean, you, you might be able to use sisal or something. Yes, yeah, sir. Know, but. Uh, um, just those fine fibers, they kind of, you, you, you let them go and they, uh, even on a calm day, they kind of float. They'll, they'll flutter, yes, sir. Yeah, so if you use that, it'll catch the uh, wind currents and just follow it. So a lot of guys use, like, dust and stuff. All that does is tell you a wind direction. You can't see it past, you know, 10 feet. That milkweed um, or thistle or whatever, you can watch that for 50, 60 yards and see what it's going to do, you know. You can see it beyond that. And, uh, you know, I'll let a handful of that stuff go and, and watch what it does and, and how it goes through the train. And um, I've had uh, um, places where 
the wind will blow to your side. I mean, it'll drop milkweed. It'll go over and hit a, hit a, uh, a wall of trees on the edge of a swamp, turn and end up where the deer are coming from, even though the wind is at a 90 degree angle from that. You know, I've had deer spook and you're like, what the hell? How do you ever win me? You know, or no, I was here and you drop milkweed and you wish you end up over there, you know, right where you spooked from. That, that, so having some, um, something like that in your pocket to test wind is huge because you learn a lot. You learn a lot about thermals, how they work. You learn how wind works. And that's how I learned so much about wind is I always have a pocket full of that stuff. It's made a huge difference for me, Dan. I'm, I'm based out of Northeast Pennsylvania and you know, I got used to using talcum powder or baby powder and, you know, seeing the wind for two or three feet, but watching it, watching what the milkweed does for 30 yards, it, it just really opened my eyes. And so that's why I, I kind of was curious if you, you test those things in the, in the spring also, but like you said, you've been doing it so long that, you know, I, I've still got a ways to go. I've seen guys try using smoke. Um, to test thermals and stuff like that too. And I've seen um, writings on that. I'd highly recommend against that <laughs> yeah. because uh, when you, when you light a smoke bomb, it heats the smoke. So it alters your findings. All right. Like, yeah. like with the changing in the afternoon, the thermals coming off, the thermals that change in a swamp because the water temperature starts changing. Right. Exactly. Cause the warm smoke is, it's just like having, it is a whole, a whole different thing than, than what the temperatures are. Your your air currents are based on temperatures. So the smoke changes what it's doing based on you're heating it up before you're releasing it. So milkweed or some type of fiber like that is, you know, the yeah. best method. I know there was some, uh, uh, there was some guys for a while in, in uh, the south that said they didn't have milkweed and they were using fibers off of yarn. Mm -hmm. I didn't try it myself. I know uh, a lot of guys swear by cattails, but when I use cattails, they're heavier than milkweed. Yes, I do sir. know that there's always people like uh, on the Beast Forum asking for milkweed and people send it to them for postage and stuff. So yeah. you probably get it if you All want right. it. Yeah, I'm I mean, on the so, Beast Forum. It's so abundant up here. Somebody will send you a sack of it and it'll last you three <laughs> four years. Awesome. Yeah, I'm on the forum, so I'll, I'll check it out and get some from somebody because like, I'm like, I mean... It, it makes a big difference because, like you talked about, like with the change right now compared, you know, everything's open because it's cold for y'all. I made that mistake this year. I'd hunted a place I usually hunted in October, the first weekend of deer season. I'd always hunt it and always see deer, and I didn't hunt it at all this year until I didn't hunt. I didn't have time to hunt just with everything going on. So I I went up there the last week of the season, and it's a public land. It's bow hunting only, and I get up there and like the area that I normally hunt you can see everywhere around you for like 300 yards and like everything's dead, you know, like the winter. And you know, it's like, it changed the game. I spent more time scouting and it turned into a really good trip because I spent, you know, time on the boots on the ground scouting and finding stuff and going through some of the stuff that you talk about. And, um, you know, that brought me to, I think one of the questions Ben and I was talking about before we got you on would, when you find a bed and it's got like some rubs and scrapes around it and everything, you know, like that's, is that usually like a, say a younger buck trying to kind of mark it, trying to make him known or, is, you know, will, will an older buck do a lot of that around his bed? Well, you should be able to look at the sign and see what kind of tracks are in the scrape, yeah. what, what height the rubs are and kind of already know that answer. Yeah. So, and, and, um, what I do see is, um, the bedding areas that usually have like, uh, heavy rub lines coming in from every direction are usually the younger deer. Two and a half year olds are really aggressive. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're just coming to age, you're like teenagers out there chasing girls around, you know? Yes. Um, they're, they're really aggressive at rubbing and stuff like that. Um, but they don't go where mature bucks are living because mature bucks are more dominant. They're afraid of, right? Yes. So mature bucks don't rub as much in their bedding areas. And there's exceptions to that. Like, uh, I'll look at public land and I'll find a killer bedding area that has maybe one rub in it, maybe some historical rubs, just enough sign to tell me big bucks have, have bedded there. So I'll look for historical rubs that are high. What I mean by historical is old scarring mm -hmm. on the trees that tell me bucks have bedded there and rubbed the trees. You know, and maybe one or two fresh ones, but not much, but big. You know, yes. uh, I would take that way over having those really rubbed up bedding areas because it that's usually younger bucks. Okay. But again, I'm looking at the height of them. 
and it usually tells the story on, on, on the sides of the box. And then a lot of guys will get pulled too because dough betting areas will have r- rubs downwind and upwind of the beds. But the difference is when it's a buck betting area, those rubs will be right in the beds. Okay. That um, that makes a so lot of sense. Cause... Yeah, look look at the look at the size of the sign. You know, that'll mm-hmm. tell you whether or not it's mature bucks or not. Yes. And that that was kind of what we discussed and I was like I think it's kind of like common sense, like, and that's what he's going to, you know, tell us what we're thinking, but I, I wanted to ask to make sure my thought process was right before I just, you know, was like, oh, this is what it is, and, you know, be wrong. Uh, let's see. So, Dan, I have, a, I have a kind of follow-up question on that. So, you know, we focus so much on, you know, scouting sign, finding that big sign, but, you know, how much effort do you put into kind of getting a big picture of the area, you know, trying to develop you know, where other doe sign is, where feeding areas are, where, you know, other points of interest are? How do you get that big picture? That's a really good question. So, um, I'm, I'm looking at, um, I want to find, I want to find big sign. So I want to, mostly I want to see rubs that are big and high, right? But they don't right. have to be in bedding areas. They could be on the edge of feeding areas. They could be in oak flats or whatever. They could be where they're doing that at midnight. I really don't care. I just want to know if there's something there to hunt, right? So yeah. all, all guys will tell me, oh, there's not a big rub anywhere in this, this area, so how do I know where the buck is? Well, he's not there because all big bucks rub, you know? So if he's living there and not just, you know, a guy might have got a camera picture, he came through in the middle of the night once or something, you know, from a different neighboring property. But if he's living there, you're going to have sign of him. So number one, I want to have that sign somewhere. But then, once I know that buck's on the property, it could even be trail cam picks. It could be a sighting. It could be that big sign. But once I know he's there, then I'm then I'm basing my setups on terrain. You know, terrain features are the biggest thing. I don't care if you're signing there or not. I just want to know. You, you know, I'm, I'm taking guesses where his bedding is, and I'm usually pretty accurate on. You know, just based on first I look at a map, then I physically look at it. I try to scout my way in if I haven't been in there before, get close, and you should see some sign coming out. It might not be glowing rubs and stuff, but you'll see sign coming out of those those areas. Um, I just went and looked at a property. We did a, uh, um, a Hill Country workshop last weekend. So Saturday and Sunday, I took uh, 25 guys out each day, and we went and looked at bedding areas in the Hill Country, and I'd never been there before. So when we looked at the map of that property... Um, it's a huge property of 300 acres. Well, there's only so many leeward ridges, and I know they're going to be better on leeward ridges, and there's one good-looking re- leeward point. So I went straight to that point, knowing that's where I'm going to find a sign. I'm going to find, you know, and if I don't find no sign there, there ain't no bucks on the property. And so I went in there, and that's where the bucks were bedding, and that was the best sign we found. So like I say, it's the train, you know. Right. Um, the terrain's going to tell me where those bucks are. Um, so once you get that down and you understand that, you can go right to the spots where the bucks should be. You just have to know there's one on the property. And then, so you're using that sign and the little breadcrumbs, the little, you know, the little sign, the, the big sign that you found other places to kind of develop a big picture and then picking out the spot that works the best for you to make a good hunt. Correct. I mean, once I know he's on the property, then I'm going to hunt down the bedding areas. There's only so many spots a big buckle bed. So say there's, uh, say you're in a swampy area, there's probably 20, 30 areas where you'll bed. I'll just hunt those down methodically based on the wind. That, that answered the question I had of, of where you'd start at. You just go from the wind. So, mm-hmm. okay. Yeah. Um, that's, that's uh, Do you have- do you map, sorry guys do you guys do you map those little the the signs that you're picking up to kind of give you that big picture or you just you have it in your head you know where the lay of the land it's a little of both i mean i i get pretty cocky and confidence where i think they'll be but i gotta right. go in there and look at how thick it is and i gotta look and see the sign and stuff to know for sure um but i can i can tell you um I've made the mistake of going past something that looks mediocre because you don't see rubs or something. And, uh, you, you know, a friend will kill the buck over there or you get a trail camp picture of him right there. Um, 
I've killed some pretty big bucks in, in, in signless areas. The very biggest buck I ever shot, I watched that buck in glass. That buck bed almost every time there's a west wind in the same spot. And I ended up killing him in that spot. I even picked up one of his sheds right in that bed. And that's the very biggest buck I ever shot. And that buck, two years in a row, I watched him bed there. And I don't know how long before that he was bedding there. And there wasn't a rub or a scrape within 100 yards of that bed. So it was just yeah, based I, off I, of I your observations. I stumbled on I saw the buck come out of it. I glassed them from a distance. I did an observation and saw them out of there. Otherwise, I probably never would have found that bed because it was such a, an overlooked spot. Is that the one that was close to the parking area? Uh, no, that was... Uh, that was when I was bedding under a willow tree, and I, I crept up to I shot it with a shotgun, but I shot it at uh, 20 yards. I crept up to him on a, in, a, um, in his bed and jumped up and shot him. Wow. Thanksgiving Day, Buck. Yep, yeah, it was Thanksgiving Day. Uh, well, I have a question. The guy, you know, you know, me and Ben are from Northeast PA, uh, but... Unlike Ben, like what what are some like tips you can give someone that going out of state for their first time? Like like say you come to PA, like what were the biggest things that changed for you to have to get a kind of grasp on where you where you felt you needed to go? Okay, so when I went, when I went to PA, the first thing I did was uh, um, I knew about where I was going about a week before I was going there, so I uh, got up some maps. I looked at where we we're, where were going to camp, and I looked out from there, and I looked at maps of the terrain. I looked for leeward ridges because it was kind of hilly in that area. Um, I looked for swamps because uh, I wanted a variety. And if there's too much oak activity or acorn activity, I wanted a, a second of options. I found some swamps. Um, and then I kind of uh, marked these spots. And then when I got there, um, as soon as I got my stuff set up, I went out and I, I drove past those spots, or at least some of them, the ones I, I really liked that were close. I glassed for deer the first night, and uh, then I dove in the next day and looked for sign and uh, and uh, hunted in the best stuff I found during the day. And then uh, the next day I scouted and did the same thing. And then when I wasn't getting down a lot in the hills, I dove down to the swamps to see what was going on down there, and it was even worse. So I went back up in the hills, and I kept just moving around until I was getting on deer, and and uh, found a system that worked, and dove in. Now I know where the, I know how they bed in the different terrains. I just had to find the pockets of deer, basically, that had mature deer. Right. So and and I found uh, two spots that, like that. We killed yeah, the deer in one of them. And the other one, I had an opportunity at a giant, if you watched the video, on the last day. Yeah, that would, you, you basically answered my, uh, my my last question. was like, did, did you find any, like, inconsistency in, like, Pennsylvania? Because I know, you can ask every other person says, you know, there's no, there's no big deer in Pennsylvania. But, you know, I have 200 acres here at my house. And, I, I mean, I don't have booners, but, I mean, I got some decent buck. But, People say Pennsylvania is basically inconsistent. I don't know. I thought it was awesome. <laughs> I can't wait to get back. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I think it's uh, uh, underrated. I, I think that it's a great state. I think there's some big bucks in there. And, and I saw big bucks. And I saw a big buck sign. And, and I'm sure uh, anybody that's running cameras out there knows what they're, they're into. Um, you know, maybe it's not... Uh, 180s and 190s like we kind of see in the midwest but you got big bucks there i mean that, that one that uh i had an opportunity on the last day had to be at least 150 class and it was a mature animal i mean i would have been real happy to take that buck i think my, my question mr dan would be uh once you um kind of get an idea and you're reading you're reading and understanding the you know where the deer are going to be in an area like your area that kind of that like and that's probably that's kind of what you're talking about like going from to pennsylvania there it's going to kind of be universal once you can read it huh like not you know it's not the same but you understand what i mean like you got an idea of what it is and they're gonna 
like you said, going where you just scouted this weekend, you knew where they were going to be because of what the previous times you've seen. So, like, once you get an idea and start, like, it kind of get will it get will it get kind of repetitive and you can be, you know, be able it, it to. Does. Terrains are different, but uh, you know, um, on, honest to God, I think if a guy gets well rounded and he starts looking at other terrains, I mean, like I'll tell guys, tell me, oh, I hunt the hills. You have other guys go, well, I hunt swamps. You know, and I hunt everything, and I think that's what makes me a better rounded hunter is because I understand the uh, hills better because I know what they do in the swamps. When I see some scenario up there, I'm like, ah, they're doing it like they do down there because they don't all bed the same. And you, you know what I'm saying? So, I mean, the more you look at, the more you scout, the better you're going to become as a hunter. Um, to, to me, I, I see a lot of guys find some little good property or something that somebody owns and they get in there and uh, they think they're Joe Hunter because they've got 200 acres locked up and they pay some huge lease for it or something and they kill a big buck out of the same tree every year and they don't even know why. Well, that doesn't make you a great hunter. It just makes you, you know, a paid killer, right? So a guy that doesn't hunt the same tree every day learns a lot more. You know, um, even me, I mean, I could. there's spots I know really well I can go in there and kill a buck pretty easy. I like to throw my friends in there and stuff because... I always want to go find something new and you know, the learning thing is, is big on me and uh, uh, maybe a little too much it probably affects my uh, <laughs> outcome sometimes, but uh, uh, going to the same tree every day doesn't teach a guy anything. You know what I'm saying? Yes. You don't learn anything. I think scouting and hunting and moving around and trying different areas and uh, go on some of them out of state hunts and stuff. And when you tag out or something, say, hey, I still got vacation left. I still have this. Why not just go try the next state over? Why not? I mean, what do you got to lose? Um, but that stuff is where you learn. You know, you don't learn by, you know, just going to the same property, same stands, rotating through them. That don't teach you nothing. And when you lose that property, you're sitting there with your thumb up your butt wondering what to do. Exactly. That's what uh, we have uh some property in north louisiana uh that my two brother-in-laws like two years ago they each killed on our our personal land up there it's uh my wife's family's place they killed a drop tie in nine that scored like a little over 160 and a big mature eight that scored a little over 150 and it was like but you know we feed year round we do it's 300 like 86 acres we make sure and what it was they had clear cut it like the year before that so all that nutrition that usually is up in the air where they can't reach was coming out of the stumps and into the ground and everything. So, you know, we grew some good deer and like they, they didn't know why we grew the good deer, but you know, Mississippi state put a whole study out on that and why and it's like, and I think that leads me to my next question is like clear, you know, fresh clear cuts. I mean, that's going to bring in deer. Are they going to, I'm not, I don't, I know you don't, it doesn't usually alter where they're going to bed, but will that, that to change some of the doe pattern, I would guess, but, uh, the, the bucks are going to be coming to that, I guess at night. So you just find the, the point, you know, you go back to your normal scout and backtrack his prints if you can, or whatever his tracks, if you can and figure out where he's bedding from there. Yeah, basically. I mean, a lot of times you get, you do get bedding on those clear coats if you got enough cover. Um, once they get thick, they're generally, to, um, they bet on the downwind side of it. Mm -hmm. So um, if you look right on the edge of the downwind side, but um, it can be tough to hunt them, I mean, because if they're feeding into the clear cuts and stuff, but uh, if they're feeding out into oaks or something, well, then then you got an opportunity. But you got to remember, if you come at them through the open woods, they're They've saw you already. with the wind to the back, the thick to the back, which is the clear cut, looking out into the open woods, right? Yes, sir. They, they're so, looking for you. So, too, if you look at clear cuts, where do they stop clear cuts? They usually stop them where the terrain starts to drop off. Yes, sir. Which also also creates great bedding because that's where bucks normally bed, right? Yes, sir. So, um, that's where I would I would look for them is right on the downwind side. And, the, you know, telling you how to hunt that is one thing because I'm not looking at it. But what I would do, and I do this in every scenario when I hunt, when I scout in spring. Like when I go out right now. I've got one scenario that works really well for me. I go find the beds that I believe they're bedding in. I look at them intimately. I think about what that deer can see, what he can smell, what he can hear from them beds. 
And it's usually not one bed, you know, it's a series of them around uh, in, in like a little tiny area of like a quarter acre because they move constantly. Yeah, sure. But uh, I'll get in that spot and I'll look at where's he seeing, you know, then I'll look at his trails coming out of there, his rub lines coming out of there, and I'll try to determine which way he's going. Sometimes there's multiple ways he comes out of there. And it might be that uh, when acorns are dropping, he goes one way. When uh, those are hot, he's going another way. When there's some other food source, he's going another way. So you kind of take an educated guess on which one he's using at which time of the year. You know, and then what I do is I follow those trails coming out of the bedding. And I follow them to a point where I believe I'm at the point of uh, he can't see me, hear me, or smell me. But I'm as close as I can be to that bed. So that's where I make my setup. And I'll do that on each one of those trails coming out of them beds. And then when I believe he's in there, you know, I know where those trails go. I got a good idea that they go to X, Y, Z. And when I see a sign pick up in those areas, ah, there's probably something bedding over there. And then I'll go hit that spot. Or if I think it's a timing thing like acorns, and acorns are at a certain time of the year, I'll hunt it at that time of the year. So it's kind of like detective work. If I think that Buck's bedding there because of uh, his trails are leading to a doe bedding area, and there's an excessive amount of rubbing in the bedding area, which mature bucks usually don't do. If you see excessive rubbing for from mature bucks, there's one of two reasons. Number one, it's because there's competition for the bed with other big bucks, which means you have multiple big bucks, which is a good thing. Number two, it's because it's rut and he's all wound up. So a lot of rub- rubbing in beds usually means it's a, you know, right around your rut frame, time of frame, uh, bedding, you know. So you try to figure out when he's bedding there. And I'm finding that these bedding there is, um, a lot of times, um, they'll have a two-week period where they're really excessively used by the bigger animals. So they might be used year-round, but those big animals hop to these spots and they move around a lot. There'll be like a two-week window when he's there all the time. You know, if you can figure out when that window is, that's the best time to kill him. And you so sometimes scattering this stuff with trail cameras and putting them on those exits and just leaving them for the year. You're not going to get intel for this year because if you're going in there getting intel, you're, you're blowing that bedding area, right? But leave it for the season, especially if it's your own land. You don't have to worry about the camera. Mm-hmm. And don't put it in the bedding area because, number one, you won't be able to cover all beds. And number two, they'll see that camera. It'll, it'll bug them. Any, any alteration to that bedding area will freak them out. So you put it on the exit trails, which is where they condense and leave anyway, so you'll get them coming out, right? Yes, sir. And then, and then uh, get that time period down. And, and once you have that time period down, then you know when to hunt it the next year. Okay. And uh, that's, that's a method that has worked very well for me. That's what I have a couple setups on public land that uh, I leave out, and um, that's I've noticed that like with my doe activities, you know I'm I found a hot area with a bunch of does on public land that are steady coming through there, and the rut time I figured out because that's when my buck traffic gets heavy in there too, but I wasn't on their bed. So this year, you know, this some you know starting probably I might go this weekend, but the next couple weeks go back up, spend time moving around, trying to find exactly where they're bedding and everything so I can have a better opportunity when October gets around to be able to shoot one. Because yeah. I've spent, there, it's a, like it's a, it's public land, it's 3,000, 2,800 acres of uh, bow hunting only public land and it's surrounded by private. So it's got some really good deer on it. And um, mm-hmm. like the thing about it, and that leads me to one of my questions, say early in the year, would you think the deer, like, the deer seem to, like, to move with the pressure of the year? Like, if they're, if they're, people are hunting way up front they're, of an area, will they move towards, be towards the back? Then if they're, if they're in the back later in the year, will the deer move, like, the people start hunting in the back, will they move back towards the front to try to avoid the pressure? That's what one would think, but I really don't see it that way. Okay. I think big bucks just avoid areas where people don't go. I mean, where people hang out, and I just, I just think that if that's the place people always end up. The day in their period. Yep. It doesn't matter if it's front or back. If it's not good real estate, he's right. not going to be there. Like I'll hear a lot of people, and I'll, and I'll chuckle. And no offense to anybody, but I'll, I'll hear a statement all the time that, uh, you, you know, I hunt uh, midweek or late in the week when hunters aren't out there, and those, you know, and then those deer are in those areas, and it's like, really? 
Big bucks are there all the time. They're, they're, a week ain't going to make no difference to a mature animal. I mean, it might to little ones. It might pressure-wise. I know a, guy, a lot of guys set up like gun season where pressure moves deer. I never see those guys shoot mature bucks. Okay. You know, mature mature bucks got those little areas off to the side. They've been through a few seasons. They know where to be. He's going to take the they, prime real estate. Right. I mean, a lot of times they'll bed right under your nose. I mean, right next to the parking lot, right next to the trail, but actually where they are, rarely do people walk. I mean, there's nothing that nobody ever walks ever. You know, people go out looking for sheds or whatever. But there's spots that people miss. I think about it like this too: is it, they don't know the difference between a deer hunter and a squirrel hunter. They don't know the difference between a coon hunter and a deer hunter. You know, and they don't. I don't think they differentiate a coyote wants to eat them and a human wants to eat them. I think they just avoid any kind of threat. So, I kind of you know, one of the reasons I do so well along the road, I believe is because, you, you know, think about everybody that goes out there, whether they're a squirrel hunter or a rabbit hunter or whatever, they don't park in that parking lot and then walk back to the road and walk along the road in between the two parking lots. That little section doesn't get hit. You know, there's nobody going in there. There's no scent. A deer can smell your scent on vegetation and where you walk probably for close to 30 days. You know, if you go out there uh, once a month, your scent is in there all the time. Uh, one of my assets for killing these deer is always being in a new spot. I keep I keep moving. Um, you, you, you know, you end up hunting some spots over and over again. We all do, right? Because yes. of the amount of spots you have and time you have, right? Mm-hmm. When I look back at my kills, um, the majority of my deer were killed during rut. The majority of my deer were killed um, out of a stand I'd hunted before. But when you get into my top 15, almost all of them are the first time I ever sat at the spot or the first time for the year. And uh, um, the majority of them were shot opening week of deer season, not opening week of bow season, not rut. Now, that was the a... majority of my deer were shot in a rut, but you're talking two and three year olds. When you get into the, the, my top like 10 or 15 deer that are all five or older, top mature deer came right right the, when you start looking at it's 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 eye-opening to me when you, you start looking at it like okay now that's the class of animal i'd like to shoot i'm willing to shoot this but this is what i'd like to shoot well i'm not going to shoot that if i'm hunting for that middle class so i'm going to hunt for that upper class and if and if so be it if i'm willing to take one of those lesser animals okay but at least i'm in the game for the giants i want i want to shoot right yes so uh, that's the way I look at it. So when I said, when I, I mean, just between your friends, I mean, we got you guys on here right now. Think about it now. The biggest bucks each one of you shot. Think about the biggest buck you ever shot. Was it in that stand that you've been hunting on for years? Or was it the first time? That, that, leave, that answers like my question, actually. I was going to ask you, like, when is, I had a bit this past season, I was so focused on a spot that you know i thought provided so much potential now i put a camera there i had a really nice bachelor group and that's where it comes like i focused and i focused all my time on that bachelor group the three big bucks that i had on the property on the same camera almost every single day and then when it came down to actual you know bow season jumping into it these bucks were nowhere to be found. And then months later, I shoot this buck 680 yards away in the swamp that is off the side of the road of my property. Mm-hmm. You know, is there, is there like a, is there, is there like a premature scouting time is what I'm trying to get at. Like I, I went in like, well, you know, yeah, through yeah, a stand you're, up you're down in the lab. Them, um, when they're in their summer patterns, it's timing. So, like, when I'm scouting them now, I'm not looking at where they're bedding now. I'm looking at the sign from hunting season. The very best time to scout is in season, after you filled your tag and you have no worries about walking into those bedding areas. Because the sign is going to be fresh right now, and you know exactly he's been here right now. The second best time is right when the season ends. Because now you can look at the sign that was in there, what he was doing not too long ago. 
um, this, you know, for the first couple months after the season, you can still see the scrapes, you can still see the rubs, you can still judge the age of the rubs, whether they're early season rubs or they're rut rubs. Um, you can still um, see the trails real well, you can still see the beds, you can still see the hair in the beds, and you can make some accurate guesses of what time of the year it was. But you're, you, you know, I'll find bucks like you're talking about too in those basher groups. I'll find them. I'll see them. But that goes right back to that, okay, I know they're on the property now. I know they're in the area. Now I'm going to hunt on the bedding areas around her because I don't think they're going to probably be bedding in that same spot when the season opens. Sometimes they are. I'll keep tabs on them. Hopefully they are. You know, I've, I've had it happen where I watch them all summer and then kill them in that spot opening week. Um, but I've had plenty of them just disappear. I mean, they're notorious up here in my area, a lot of bean fields, and the beans turn yellow right around the opening week, and they shift to, like, acorns. And there'll be guys that just think they got this deer made every day is in the same spot, and just a week before season, they disappear. It happens all the time. But, but, like, in the case of your buck that you shot 600 yards from her, they ain't far away. They're around there somewhere. At least usually. I have se- I have seen them disperse, and one of the basher group bucks shows up five miles away. But for the most part, they are there somewhere, right around where you saw them. So it's just a matter of finding where they are. So again, it goes into, okay, you know they're on the property. It's the terrain. A lot of guys will um, they'll listen to what I preach. They'll come to a seminar. They'll look at some beds with me or something. And then they'll go out and, uh, um, like, like, like I say, a lot of guys will stop me at a show or something. Hey, can you look at a map? Where did you think I should go? And you show them where to go. And they get this little doubt in their mind. I'm like, I don't know if you can really pick a spot on a map and there's going to be beds there. And they go out there and they look kind of half-hearted and all of a sudden, holy crap, the bed's exactly where you said it would be. And you can tell that from, from features on a, on a map. You know, there should be bedding there. So they go there and there's bedding there and there's big rubs there and it, they oh my God, I got this thing pinned, and they put all their eggs into that basket. What you got to remember is, I do 80 or 90 hunts a year. Every hunt, I'm in a spot like that, and I get about five or six opportunities. So so you can't put all your eggs into one basket. You still have to hunt that thing down. You might not be there the day you hunt, and then you've already got your scent in there. They don't bed real consistent and real consistent patterns. If it was 100%, Man, I'd kill a deer every time I went out, right? <laughs> so, so you gotta you gotta remember that. I mean, I, mean, I think uh, you know one of the things that I portray wrongly sometimes, and I don't mean to, and I try not to, and and I actually try to show my videos in a way that you see the the, the truth of the hunts and, and how they, they pan out. But I think a lot of guys they look at your wall of you know fifty bucks and they think my God, this guy's so smart. He goes out and he shoots a buck every day, but it's not like that. I mean, you still got to work for him. You know, it's not like when you find that pristine spot, you're going to absolutely kill that deer. You, you have to, you find that spot, you can't get so locked on it that you're just watching that buck thinking you're killing him or, or whatever. You still got to be thinking about the big picture. Okay, what am I going to do if that deer's not there after day one? You know, so that you don't get that hunt in there and then you're like, well, now what? Say, say you do do that, like you go in and he wasn't there, will you, and you, you won't go back to that spot, huh? Uh, probably not. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a fan of, um, you can hunt a spot about three times a year. Um, and I only do that to, to, to make a determination of what time frames he's hunting there. I go hunt there once early season, once for and once late season. Um, I don't think it would hurt you to hunt a spot two days in a row. Okay. You know, um, but I think uh, if you start hunting it on a regular basis, I think that there's going to know you're there. Huh. Your scent's going to stay there for 30 days or so, and and if your scent's there all season, why would you want to be there? I'd... You, you know, I've got spots where um, I've gone in and somebody found it, and it's been a great spot. There's a buck there every year, and you go in there, and now there's a tree stand up, there's a trail camera sitting there, and you're like, oh, crap, there's a trail beat down to the stand. And you're like, okay, so you just leave. And you notice at the end of the year, all the rubs are absent that were there the year before, all the years before. They're not getting opened. The scrapes aren't getting opened. You come back the next year, the stand's still there. There's no scrapes, no rubs. You come back the next year, now the stand's gone, the, the, the camera's gone, 
a guy went a season or two without seeing a deer anymore. You know, he had good action, so he put up the, cam- the camera to stand. It takes about a year or two years before they even come back. That I've watched it over and over again. They are so touchy around their bedding areas. And that's why the old timers used to tell us, don't go near the bedding areas. Because you go in there and you stumble around, you don't know what you're doing. Those deer vacate. <laughs> so that's the, the whole thing is that one or two precision hits. You, you got to get the timing down and hit it on the right day. Okay. Did you guys watch my hunt uh, this last fall? Sir? Did you watch my hunt last fall in uh, Wisconsin? I believe I did. I watched several different ones you have out. And, uh... well, that one, uh, that one I, uh, I scouted that deer um, two years ago. I've been hunting that deer for about five years. And I scouted him um, two years ago, even though I know the area intimately. It's just driving me nuts that I couldn't kill him. Because that was one of those old deer that stays in the same spot all the time. But it's a nasty cattail swamp. There's no trees. And it's just hard to get next to him. And every time you get in there, he, he, he just moves around you. He knows you're there. It's really hard. You're in water all the time. There's some little humps he duds on. And he moves around. But I, I was just like, there's got to be some flaw to this buck's plan and i went in there and i really scouted it heavy and i found this little and i kind of knew it was there but it took me seeing it in the spring and really looking at it to figure this out there's this little high spot in the cattails that had some willow willow brush growing on it you couldn't see that um from anywhere you had to be actually standing there to see it because it was in the height of the cattails and you know looking over the cattails all you see is cattails but she's getting this willow brush, and it's all rubbed up. The, the trees are broken off, and something you tell her, big buck rubs. And there was probably 20 or 30 beds in there, in big beds. And they're worn beds. So something's bedding in there consistently for at least a time period. And I'm looking at that, and I'm thinking, willow brush only grows its leaves till like, early October. Then they drop their leaves. Ain't no buck bedding there in broad daylight. When those leaves are on those bushes. So I knew those rubs were being made and those beds were being made and used um, in early season, you know, in September. Um, and I knew that I knew it wasn't August because they had hard antlers. They're rubbing the trees. So I had a time period of about two, three weeks. And I'm like, in two, three weeks, they put down all this, these, these rubs in, in all those beds that buck has got to be here almost all the time now honestly there's about three big bucks in there that it could have been but this one i've got a well all of them i have a pretty good history of but this particular one is the one i was really after and uh there was a trail coming out of there you can see that the, on the cattail trail antler height all the cattails come out of them the, the beds are busted off like the racks catching on the cattails or if it's a doe or young bucks going down those trails they just slither right through them you know so um 75 yards from those beds there's a bush that i could get a stand in it's a tree but it's like you know you can get your fingers halfway around it so i could get a stand up about uh eight feet off the ground i cut a hole out to the trail so i looked at where the bed you know the beds were where you'd come out yes in that first year and then I, once i had it set up and i knew what i wanted i knew i wanted a north wind a brisk north wind because i have to get around this buck because uh, i have to come from his way to get to where i could hunt him so i had to come around him so i figured out a plan for that i actually made a trail in the summer to do that because otherwise it'd make too much noise and i, I just left it alone and uh, when September came, and the very first brisk north wind I had that matched what I needed, which was a couple of days into the season, I slipped out there. And you got to wade through, like, waist deep water to get out there. But I slid out there, um, hooked around, got in the tree, and as quiet as I could, set the stand up, got in it, and in the evening it started calming down. And, wind started dying and the doe pops up 15 yards from me but it never heard me set up the stamp or anything then another one pops up like 25 yards in front of me 
the one to the front starts feeding its way back towards me out of the cattails into the into the uh, brush and then it actually goes right underneath me when it gets underneath me um i only used um two sticks to get up in a stand and the rest of them were sitting at the base of my tree and i'd seen them and it looks at the sticks <laughs> stares at them <laughs> And then it looks at the next stick and looks up at me and sees me and just comes out of its skin, jumps up in the air and runs back where it came from. And, I was, and meanwhile, while it was underneath me, I could hear a deer coming from those beds in front of me, the buck beds. I could hear one sloshing, and, and I'm assuming it's a buck. Um, I can even see cattails moving, which, is, which I assume is their antlers catching on, but I couldn't actually see the animal. But in my mind, I'm envisioning that's probably him. The doe sees this, runs in between me and him, and just starts snorting and snorting and stomping. And when she finally runs off, whatever that animal was, I can hear wander off through the cattails the, the wrong way. It didn't run, but it just was not coming over here now. So I gave it a hunt the next day, just in case. He came back or he stayed there. Nothing. Then I just left it alone. I think most people would have just came in there and just raped that spot. They would have just kept pounding it until they ruined it. I know better. You want to go hunt it again, but I know better. So I just left it alone. So this September comes along, and I go in there and the exact same thing. as the brisk north wind. Go slip in there. Do that whole hook around thing. Get in there. Um... Same scenario. The only thing that was different is no does got up. Not a one. Hear the deer get up in that, that uh, willow brush come to me. It was him. And I shot him right where he was exactly supposed to be. But you see how it's not something that happens overnight. You, you, you know, it's a great spot. You expect it to happen, but I'm usually in a spot like that. You know, a scenario like that. But it doesn't always work out. So it, it took you a year to get back it because of that doe. Mm -hmm. right. so i found a spot it took me two years of hunting that spot three hunts to kill that deer but two of the hunts were the same hunt in my mind i was just keeping that deer honest by hunting it the day after <laughs> yes he spoke just in case he came in the next day yes sir. and he might i think it's probably like about a one in five chance but yeah one in five but there's that, that bad. there's that anyway. one time uh that actually leads me to a question uh do you see more of your you know, bigger bucks, mature bucks, morning or evening hunts? And what do you prefer? Evening. Evening? Evening, because they're more consistent. Um, I know a lot of guys will argue that and say they do better in mornings, and I think deer run, run you know, in rut. Deer move pretty good in the mornings. But uh, the consistent patterns are hard for me in the, in the mornings. I, I have certain situations that work real well, um, but when they come out of bedding, they come out real consistent. Right where I expect them to be. When they go into bedding, it's different. So when you look at a bedding area and you see those trails spidering from the bedding area, those are all pretty much evening trails. Because when they come in in the morning, they circle around to downwind of that bedding area and they come in wind the nose, get to their bed, turn around and watch their their, uh, from behind. their trail. Their trail. With the wind to their back, they smell from behind them and they watch their access trail to their bed downwind of it so um figuring out exactly where to be and not get winded is tough when they come in from downwind you can do it i mean uh and i've, I've had access to action doing that like uh one of the things we've done is um set up right on the edge of an opening or something because they're usually not going to hook out into the opening to follow the edge of it and then circle in from down, downwind <clears throat> okay but another problem with it is is quite often mature bucks are bedded before daylight. And a lot of times I'll get into those bedding areas uh, two hours before daylight and, and listen to the buck get up and run off. So the inconsistency is, now, do I really want to risk that in one of my spots that I could just go in there in the evening and have not think a thing of walls right out? So the evenings, I know where he is. I know exactly where he is during the day, right? I know how close I can get. I know what tree I can get into. I know where he's going to go based on the trail coming out of there. It's a lot more consistent for me in the evenings. Okay. But 
you know, during a rut, mornings can be pretty hot, <laughs> but I just don't think the bedding area scenario and the consistency is good. I've, I've killed some good bucks going into bedding in the mornings too, um, but I usually set up a little further back. Uh, so maybe a couple hundred yards back and get them where they're before they start circling downwind or something because they just get a little inconsistent in the mornings coming into, into that stuff. You know, and usually during a rut, you get, I start, you know, it's probably different in Louisiana, but probably similar in Pennsylvania. You know, I start looking for the morning hunts around October 15th is when I start, it starts picking up for me in the mornings. Before that, they just seem like they're always bedded in the morning when I get in there. Yeah, I think it's relatively the same. I think I think for for us, and I think I start getting more in the morning hunts like around the end of October. Halloween time, I like to base it off of like. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, ours is um about like that too because like. Years ago, we um, Louisiana's deer population got really low, you know, in the 60s or whatever, and they brought in different deer from different areas. We actually have, you know, it's pretty much the bred out of them by now, but they we have uh, Wisconsin genetics in our deer. And um, yeah. our rut is crazy down here. Like, in a rut, like the area I live in, that you'll start, you'll have does that don't get bred till like February. Our North Louisiana... In West Louisiana, we, we can, it'll be around Halloween. And it's like, our season, like, in, our season, depends on where you're at, starts September 15th and runs to, in another part of the state, state in, in, all, in the next part of the state, and it runs to, like, February 15th. So you got, like, 150-something days. But it's like, the areas that run late into, like, February 15th, a lot of times you're catching the rut during that last couple weeks, that first couple weeks of February. It's, it's really weird. <laughs> it's like, you know, and my favorite thing, and you probably see it and hear it all the time too. Like everybody, as soon as they, as soon as they see a deer, a buck up moving, all oh, they chase it. It's the rut. No, he was just like, he was 10, you know, he, he just happened to be on the same trail that doe was that day. He wasn't like after her. And that's, I think that's a big misconception of it. And you probably see it and, you know, can you, you understand what I'm saying? Like, everybody automatically, when they see a buck up behind a doe, it doesn't matter how far behind he was. All it was rutting, it was chasing. And like, yeah, I guess. Uh, I mean, I've actually seen him chase outside a rut. Yes, sir. You know, I've seen him chase earlier and later. Exactly. Uh, and, and some does are, weak, are, you know, have something wrong with them. They go in the heat earlier or later or whatever, just genetically. Mm-hmm. But, um, Obviously, the majority happens at the same time, in the, um, same time frame every year. Yes, sir. And, you know, geog- geographically, um, that time changes. Like in Wisconsin here, um, and, I, and a lot of people don't really see this, um, probably because they don't hunt um, different areas like I do. I, I move around a lot. But western Wisconsin, I really see the last week of October being the hot cruising phase. And where I live which is only two hours different um, the the cruising phase is like the first week of November. But then if I get down south of the border, like into Illinois and Indiana and in Iowa, um, a lot of times I see it, you know, uh, a week or two into November. Um, it varies, you know, probably genetically and, and, and whatever, but uh, you will see that rut be the exact same time every year so i would throw all those rut calendars into garbage what really determines uh, rut action is moon phase or weather or something like that that uh will determine whether it's during the day or at night but the deer are bred on the same days because you, you, fawns are born on the same days every year the same time period yes you know? it's not like that rut varies but uh there's people selling calendars and all kinds of stuff based on that when the rut's going to be and that's just bogus um any biologist can tell you that the rut's the same time every year based on when they have the full you know yes sir so but like you said down by you that is a little different because you have a wide a very wide variety of rut down there yeah it's 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 crazy and it's like you know and it's, it, it cracks me up and you know even the our old biologist and our new biologist for the wildlife and fisheries actually got in an argument at a meeting like a couple weeks ago because 
the deer herd has went down under the new one. So he started griping. The old one was like, hey, you're doing this wrong. And they, he actually told me he didn't know what he was talking about. It was kind of funny. It was like in a public meeting venue, they get in an argument about it. I'm like, you know, so it's like typical, you know, just normal stuff, you know. So, uh yeah, at least you got good biologists making those decisions. We got good biologists that are ran by politicians and have to do what politicians say so they don't get to use their skills. <laughs> that that was you know uh, that 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 that's a that's a that bad deal there. Uh, yeah, yeah. So we uh, I, I don't know how much time you have, and I'm not trying to rush you in any way. Uh, we're a little into an hour over this. Uh, you know. Yeah. I think to sort of kind of close it down, like what, like what's next for you, Dan, with like the hunting beast? Like what's what 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 next big big things can sort of expect if you can give us kind of like a, a hint? Like no, you don't have to tell us to spill the whole beans, but uh, you, you know, not not much is going to change. I got uh, you know um, new new equipment I'm working on, releasing for like hunting beast gear. Um, you know we're gonna do uh, we're, we're gonna do more of the same. Um, my goal with hunting beasts is um, to uh, make people better hunters and hunters better people. So it's just always uh, focused on helping people. Um, I think that uh, if um, people find success and they start understanding how to um, how to hunt better, so that they uh, can enjoy it more. I think they'll hunt more, and I think uh, if everybody hunted in this world, it'd be a better place. So um, that's always been my goal, um, to focus on uh, helping people. I think uh, that makes me feel good. So that's all I'm doing, and uh, I'm just going to continue to do that as long as I'm physically capable. So, Can we, uh, can we expect anything with anything more with you know you and the hunting public can we expect this next hunting season you know some more videos with them hunting with the hunting beast yeah i, I believe we're going to continue on with the um the uh, public land challenges we do one a year um as long as they're willing to do them um, you know I'm, I'm wanting to do them so that you know you keep watching for those i i would you know I never know what to go up to leave. Um, Aaron's always uh, in the past asked me where, where I want to go, and I'm always like, I like a surprise. You you choose and just tell me, you know, point me in a direction, and I'll be there. So I never know what I'm I'm getting into. You know, I'd imagine sooner or later they're going to go out east. Sooner or later they're going to go down south. Down south will be a challenge for me getting down like in your area, maybe of Louisiana or hey, you know, maybe Alabama or something. I never know and. Um, I always look forward to it, and, you know, a lot of times you think, oh, you know, how am I going to be successful on that stuff? They'll find a way. Yes, yeah, just, you know, the, the the knowledge you've made everywhere else, I mean, just with what you do there, you know, like you said, the swamps, and the, mm -hmm. it, you can apply it, and that's what makes you so... You yeah, it's, it's universal. It, it is. It, what, what'll get me, um, you know, where I'll have problems is, like, little problems geographically, you know, like... Uh, Maybe uh, pigs get in an area, and I'm not used to pigs, you know? <laughs> so I'll have to deal with figuring that out. But I'll still the betting and stuff will still be the same for me. Yes, you know. Uh, so it like like we said, like and you hit on that helping people. We we want to thank you again, like you you know taking time out of your schedule and your night and everything to spend this time with us. I mean, it's it's awesome. You know, it's an honor to have you on our podcast here. Um, look, you know, like. You bring so much knowledge out there that a lot of people just, you know, it's once you say it, it sounds so simple. But before you say it, you wouldn't think of it. I, I hear that a lot. A lot of people say, well, Jesus is all common sense, but I never thought of it. <laughs> exactly. And uh, that, that's that's how I feel because that's what I think Ben and I talked about before we started. I was like, Man, some of these questions I ask are probably common sense. And it's like, you know, it's like I, I kind of got an idea, but I don't want to like. I'd like to hear it from somebody that really knows so I know that I'm thinking the right way. And uh, we appreciate that. You know, Ben, you. Yeah, no, Dan, you've really influenced me. I, I, I work with a lot of hunters and, you know, you've created a culture that, you know, you're making everyone better. And 
you know, I can't thank you personally enough. And, you know, I see it, I see it with what I do. So really from the bottom of our hearts, thank you. Well, I appreciate that. You know, I think it's contagious too. I think uh, you help people and then people help people. When I grew up, uh, nobody told their secrets. As a matter of fact, when I first started uh, doing that and uh, releasing DVDs back in those days, it was the Blood Brother DVDs. Uh, I got a lot of people mad at me. They're like, you're releasing the secrets. And it's like, well, geez, I mean, people are out there struggling. You know, and it shouldn't be a contest. But by, you know, help people, I, I see people like you, you guys. And the reason I'm willing to come on your podcast, I know you guys are, are still growing. You're, you're small and you're trying. But you're reaching out and you're helping people in your community. And that's why I want to help you guys. That's why I wanted to look at who you were before I helped you. Not based on size. It's based on what you're doing. You know, and I, I like what you guys are doing. And I, uh, I think you're a good group of guys. You know, and keep doing what you're doing. Keep moving forward and keep helping people. We appreciate that. I mean, that that, that means a lot. Um, Jay, what you? I see the wheels turning. Yeah, yeah. I uh, as we're winding down, yeah, I can't I can't thank you enough. I mean, I've used your information. I'm a I'm a mentor for a, a wounded vet organization that you know I I take so many soldiers out every year on 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 buck hunts and you know having a uh, the knowledge, you know, that you use and actually watching your videos, you know, I, I'm not going to bring these guys in, you know, from California who don't know, who've never shot a, a gun before to, you know, hopefully put them on a deer. Like I want to take them out and actually be able to, you know, find the sign and put them on the spot and be like, you know, it may take us three, four five days, but you know, we'll, I'll, I'll put them on something. And I have, I've been, I've been pretty successful. I've only been doing it for about four years now, but, and I've been successful every year. That's cool. That's really so I cool. Couldn't, I couldn't thank you enough for, you know, your information that you helped me grow, you know, my mindset a lot with my tactics and strategies. So thank you for that. I appreciate it. Uh, we, we appreciate it. We, um, you know, taking time, we're going to uh, go and start winding it down. We appreciate once again, I know I'm saying it over, you know, appreciate it. You're welcome to be, you know, talk with us anytime because, I mean, I think you're just, a, you know, full of knowledge that can help everybody. And uh, well, the coolest part of it is you're willing to share it. You know, like you said, it's a it's a world that a lot of people used to not share, and it's still kind of a tight-knit world. And cool. So, yeah, you guys, uh, you know, once that, uh, that link is uh, shareable, Mm -hmm. um tag me on it and i'll uh, share it maybe get you guys uh some people watching and listening all right we we truly appreciate that sure all right thank you thank you mr dan i'm uh gonna end the phone call here and uh i appreciate you okay thanks guys thank you thank you this is julius craig with dove lodge outdoors we just stopped with the recording with mr D mr dan infall i mean that was an amazing thing and i learned a lot from it